Good morning. Good morning again to all of you. And thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for providing the music today. I am so delighted, as I said, to co-lead worship with uh, Reverend Botts. And soon we are, in for a st we are in for a treat when Victor provides our special music this morning. Would you please pray with me? Oh, loving and kind God, we thank you for gathering us around your word for us this day. Speak to us now and touch us with what it is that each one of us needs to receive this day. And oh, dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy, holy name. In Jesus' sweet name, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the last time that I preached, a few weeks ago, I shared with all of you that Shane, my spouse, and I are beginner gardeners in this new stage, this new season of our lives. But, as I also told you, we are certainly not rushing into this new interest and pastime of ours. Rather, we are moving at a very gradual and incremental pace. The spiritual director in me likes to say that we are being very intentional about this new practice and discipline of ours. Now, it has almost been about two months, it was on Mother's Day, that Shane planted some cherry tomatoes in the garden box in our backyard. And since then, we have been witnessing the gradual growth and the ripening and the flourishing and even plenitude of our tomatoes. And I must say, that they are very, very sweet and quite tasty as well. Now, as I noted a few weeks ago, Jesus often used gardening parables and lessons to teach his followers about the nature and the attributes of the kingdom of God. And of course, that is to be expected given the agricultural context of first-century Palestine, where the majority of the people were peasants and farmers. Now, this Sunday, our Gospel reading offers us another lesson about planting seeds and nurturing growth, but it is a planting and a seeding, and a farming, and a harvesting, if you will, of another kind. Our reading from Mark this morning is probably a familiar story to you, but it is also a painful and upsetting story. And it's one of those many discomforting gospel readings because it's the first story that we have here in Mark of Jesus being rejected. And, of all places, this incident happened in his hometown by his own people there in Nazareth. On one hand, it is very hard to understand how this could have happened there in what he likely considered to be a safe and sacred space, surrounded by family and friends and neighbors, and right there in the very synagogue where he had been nurtured in his faith as a child. Now, at first, the hometown folks, who likely had played a role of some sort in his faith formation, were absolutely captivated by his teaching, or so it seemed. They, they exclaimed, what is this wisdom that has been given to him? 
what deeds of power are being done by his hands. But, but, it wasn't long before this sense of familiar er familiarity turned into contempt. And the hometown folk then sneered and said, is not this the son of the carpenter? The son of Mary and the brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? And they mentioned his sisters too. What do you make of this highly charged moment, this unexpected turn of events, this poignant moment where Jesus was being rejected by those who we want to believe loved him the most, and where, that is, in his hometown synagogue, we would assume would have been a welcoming and safe and accepting and affirming place where he could return. Well, our text this morning tells us that Jesus did respond to the harsh reaction of his hometown folk with some pointed words of his own. Jesus said, prophets are not without honor except in their own hometown and among their kin and in their own house. Now, it is important to understand that this story from Mark is the first instance where Jesus is described as a prophet. And the word prophet comes from the biblical Greek root word prophetes, refers to someone who receives revelations from God for others, for the people. In the Hebrew scriptures, prophets are the ones who gave messages to the kings and to the nations. And these prophetic messages would either lead people to salvation or explain why God was about to punish them. The words that Jesus spoke that day to the community that played a significant role in his faith development were strong words. They were powerful words, and they were words that were loaded with meaning about the true identity of this familiar one, this beloved one from their own community this one who they knew and loved as Jesus. In my reflections on this text during the past couple of weeks, I admit, I confess, that I can easily relate to the townspeople of Nazareth because there certainly have been moments and times in my life when I wasn't able to recognize the presence of the living Christ right there in my midst. Those times when I have held on to grudges rather than letting them go. There are times when I have not taken responsibility for the ways that I have hurt others. And those times when I have dug in my heels rather than opening myself up to another way of thinking or being or relating to one another. And there certainly have been countless times when I have relied on my own understanding rather than seeking God's desire for my life. In a biblical commentary that I recently read about our text from Mark, written by the Reverend Dr. Beverly Zink Sawyer, who is a professor of preaching and worship at Union Seminary in New York City, which is one of our UCC seminaries 
by the way. She wrote, The people of Nazareth expect to see the Jesus who they have always known, the one who seems no different than them. And so they aren't able to see beyond their own limited views of him. Can you think of a time in your life when it was difficult to recognize the presence of the living Christ right there in your very midst? Maybe, maybe it was a time when you weren't able to recognize an open door or an open opportunity when so many other doors had previously closed on you. Maybe it was a time when your worries about the future actually prevented you from moving forward. Or maybe it was a time after you had been hurt by others that you then responded by closing yourself off to new relationships. Or maybe it was a time like Jesus when you were rejected by your faith community rather than being accepted for who you truly are. In our text for this morning, Jesus certainly rattles the members of his hometown faith community for their inability to recognize him for who he truly was. And so, I believe that the invitation for us this day as followers of Jesus is to create the intentional and sacred space in our lives where we would experience personal growth and spiritual healing, including the unconditional love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In times of uncertainty and change and heightened anxiety, it can be so hard to recognize the living Christ in our lives. And so, as we faithfully navigate these times of transition, both in our personal lives and across our nation, as well as in our life together as First Church, may we do so in a spirit of openness, and mutuality, and humility, and collaboration. And may we always seek to recognize the active presence of the living Christ in our very midst. In recent days, as I was reflecting on this theme, uh, this theme of the closedness of our gospel scene from Mark for today, and the closedness of those who had gathered at the synagogue in Jesus' hometown and were unable to really see Jesus for who he truly was. I was reminded and inspired by some prayerful words that were written by the late Reverend Dr. Howard Thurman, who many of you know was one of the mentors to the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Received these words of prayer, these words of blessing from Dr. Thurman. This prayer is called, Lord, Lord, Open, uh, <clears throat> open unto me. Open unto me light for my darkness. Open unto me courage for my fear. Open unto me hope for my despair. 
Open unto me peace for my turmoil. Open unto me joy for my sorrow. Open unto me strength for my weakness. Open unto me wisdom for my confusion. Open unto me forgiveness for my sins. Open unto me tenderness for my toughness. Open unto me love for my hates. Open unto me thyself for myself. Lord, Lord, open unto me. May we all be inspired to create the intentional space for spiritual growth and healing in our lives and in our life together as First Church and in the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.